like everybody knows me and I don't know you. <laughs> uh, my mother's voice in public at a shopping with her. I heard it a lot growing up because I spent a lot of time with my mother. She said, stop embarrassing me a lot. Quit it. Don't, what do you know? Just stop being so obvious, <laughs> right? Let me describe who that little boy was that heard those messages. One of the first things that I begged my mother for was a three-piece suit. <laughs> I like ties and suits, I still do. I like to play chess. So one of the first things I was ever obsessed with as a kid was teaching other people how to play chess. So there I am in a three-piece suit with my learn how to play chess Board, teach others how to play chess. Right. I got from my mom about Christmas. Want to play chess? Can I teach you how to play chess in my little three piece suit? I stood out like a sore thumb. Did you stand out like a sore thumb? <laughs> Did you ever feel like you couldn't disappear? I've never been able to disappear. I'm completely clockable. <laughs> Uh, you can spot me from across the room. There is a there is a light that is shining on me, and so I have been the target of every bully and every you know nasty thing that has ever happened. <laughs> My saving grace is that I'm six one, two twenty, double letter double letter athlete in gymnastics and track, and I have never lost a fight. <laughs> So I'm willing to be on your pecking order, but most people find out very quickly that it doesn't last very long. But it hasn't been easy to do. I don't think it's very easy for a lot of us, especially if you just can't disappear. You can't not be seen. You can't choose not to engage. I grew up deep inside the military industrial complex. I grew up in a gated community. There were gun turrets and jeeps and uniforms and people snapping to salute when my father walked into the room. He had a lot of scrambled eggs on his thing and pointed by the UN to be at the second NATO uh, theater. You know, my dad was the, uh, appointed by Jimmy Carter to be the chaplain for the Bethesda Medical Center. I was seen, I had to be there. I was there, my, my parents entertained a lot. I embarrassed my mother and my father a lot because I couldn't not be seen. I grew up deep inside the military industrial complex, so I know all about toxic masculinity. That was toxic masculinity was held up as the highest form, as an, something to achieve. I grew up deep inside the Southern Baptist Church. My father is a chaplain in the Southern Baptist Church. My mother said, I raised all my kids right. They cut their teeth on the back pew of the First Baptist Church. She's not lying. That's when there wasn't a nursery and all the new mothers sat in the back of the church so you could leave really quickly, you know? So we grew up in Navy, so I moved every two years of my life. I had to learn a new set of friends, a new way to be, a new set of classes, a new culture every two years. Every two years I had to keep relearning the rules and relearning the rules and kept trying to have to fit in and kept trying to figure out how I could just survive so I could not be seen, so that I wouldn't get hurt, I wouldn't be challenged, somebody didn't want to always try to be taking me down. I internalized that so much that I began to tell my mother how she should dress. 
<laughs> what kind of earrings she should wear, uh, how to put on makeup better and look more feminine. A few years later, not too long ago, I had to apologize to my mother, you know, for laying all of that on her, you know, turning my turning that embarrassment I had learned back on her. I had to apologize to my own mother for trying to police her femininity. Well, I even became the uh, youth pastor of Veers Mill Baptist Church, you know, until they found out about my extracurricular activities <laughs> that I will not go into detail about. <laughs> I'll just let you use your dirty minds and, you know, amp that up a few. Um, I left the church or the church left me, whatever it is that you, you know, however that happened and that's what, you know, cause that's kind of how it felt like I left the church, but I also felt like the church and God and everything left me. I first discovered A Course in Miracles in 1982, but I didn't want to listen to one more thing that Jesus had to say. You know, I think we've all been there in that moment when you have to find it. I abandoned all the religion, all the rules that I had ever known. I abandoned how to be a man for my father. I abandoned how to get along. You know, I was a different person at church. I was a different person at my family. I was a different person at school. I was a different person in the world. I was a different person around my dad because I had learned the different rules about how to keep you from picking on me. Be whatever you needed me to be. Do you know what kind of that training led me into a life of prostitution and a hustler. In the 80s, I became a hustler because I could transform myself and be whoever you needed me to be. To survive. And I became a junkie and a hustler on the wild streets of Main Street, Kansas City. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just more learning rules. That led me into going to jail. And in that cell was scratched out on the wall was I will never be here again. And that hit me. It's like, I'm drawing the line right here. I do not want to learn how to be a good inmate. Yes, yes. You know, I do not want to learn how to, I don't want to learn any more about the justice system. I don't want to learn any more about how to do this right or be the tough guy or learn any of that system. I, did, I was like, I'm drawing the line here. And I got sober, I stopped shooting up, and as luck would have it, I found myself drawn to Earth Rising, uh, it's called, it was called uh, Earth Rising Center in Leavenworth, Kansas. It was a clothing optional camping site, <laughs> right? So I spent weekends in there was, it was, they had a pond and it was fantastic. I felt like I, I could let I could let go and not be I mean just be seen, try on new things. And there, like Reverend Yolanda, I found the radical fairies. The radical fairies have assigned me to go to the, for your first gathering. It says, "Welcome home." Yes. <laughs> Welcome home. And then right after there, there's a nail salon. So you could like get yourself all, all and I'm not getting you. <laughs> so because it was seriously allowing me to put on and to try on something new. Who was I? Who was I without the rules? Who was I if I didn't bounce everything off you? Who was I if I didn't have to construct your life and how I was going to fit in it? Who was I? I didn't really have any of those answers. All I was was smart enough and intuitive enough to know how to manipulate you and others and manipulate and damp down myself and learn something new and be a new person. That's all I knew how to do. I never dug down and found out and answered that really difficult question, who are you? Who am I? I'm really glad I did. I'm really, really grateful that I did. And it wasn't easy. I fell on my face a lot. If you've tried on a bunch of personalities, you're gonna try on a few that don't work, <laughs> right? And I did that. I made mistakes.
But what I did do was learn how to be comfortable in showing you and being myself with you in front of others if it didn't matter and like let the let the consequences happen just let them happen and because of that i wound up in new york city just after 911 when it was still smoking with the with the, that hole was still smoking black uh smoke and there was all these uh Fundraisers. Remember all the. If you remember all the fundraisers, one every weekend, one every if, every other day. I went to a loft party in uh, Chinatown the, that the radical fairies were giving, and they were uh, raising money for the homeless and the undocumented and uh, people that weren't being counted and weren't didn't weren't available for services. So we were gathering uh, to to food to fund food banks and and shelters and things like that for people displaced by 9/11. Uh, the, uh, the undocumented stuff. And there I met Reverend Yolanda for the first time. <laughs> she doesn't meet me for a few more years, but I met Yolanda that night and fell in love with Yolanda. She was dressed as a nun. <laughs> and she was singing Sympathy for the Devil. <laughs> But what made me fall in love with her was that she included a, void, a, a verse to offer sympathy for the hijackers in their families. She offered us to say, remember how we got here. Remember the people that were on the train. A lot of people were dying there. What kind of pain do you have to be in to do that? So that is who Reverend Yolanda is. And there was a couple other performers there that night. There was an opera singer and a comedian and they would they would fit, they would finish and everybody would like, yay, woo, they throw money in the basket. It was really fun time, pass the drinks, it was fantastic. Yolanda quit, Yolanda quit singing. Ta. Crickets, crickets. And I thought, that is who I am. That is who I'm going to be. I am going to give you me at my highest level and say and require you to say, to step up to where I am. I'm gonna trust you to have integrity to be able to see a new thing. I'm gonna trust you to say, oh, is that who you are? Yes, no, but I'm not kidding. She wasn't kidding. And I fell in love with her that night because she wasn't, she was gonna authentically at a high, at, really high skill level show me who she was and everybody was and i wanted that kind of courage i wanted that kind of life i wanted that to be natural and cool and desirable in and... a couple of years later we're at a fairy gathering you know those uh, thanksgiving parties where Everybody leaves town, but the people who can't leave town <laughs> all get together and bring, you bring a pot and you bring a pot and you bring a pot and everybody gets together, you know? And, and I met Yolanda at one of those parties and we have never been separated since. So I could recognize her, but she could recognize me when I was there as well. So it's, it's, it's out there. I'm, I'm asking you, to rethink the rules. My ask is consider to screw the rules. <laughs> consider screwing the norms. Consider screwing every rule that you thought you had to live by to be safe. Consider asking again the question, who am I and am I dumbing it down for you? My mother's greatest uh, gift to me, I used to call her my, uh, my first guru. She says, everybody deserves your best. My dad's gift to me was that uh, he said that uh, a, a, a life of fulfillment, to be fulfilled in your life, you must serve. So today I'm standing before you uh, saying, I don't have anything to hide because I like all that I have found inside. I'm not hiding anything because I don't have anything I'm ashamed of anymore. There are things that I have done less well, but there is nothing I am willing to be ashamed of. 
I'm an anarchist because I believe that you and I, without somebody telling us the rules, can decide how we are going to have a relationship together. I am a Course in Miracles expert because I believe in in that it is my healing is available to me and that I can see the blocks to the awareness of the presence of love, which is you. And I really like uh, permaculture a lot, the whole systems design theory. This is a famous permaculture teacher who wrote a book called The Pigness of Pigs. He says, if you raise pigs to be pigs, you'll not only have happy pigs, but you'll have really healthy pigs and they'll even taste better. <laughs> so that's what I want to be. I want to be, I want you to know the glenness of Glen. So when you experience me, you'll have a good taste in your mouth, right? You'll have a good taste. I want to offer you the good taste that is me. So fuck the rules, you're worth it. Ha, ha, ha.